Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, God. You're an awesome, awesome God, full of goodness and mercy and grace. So, during this message, uh, one of the things that I, I want you to think about is what keeps you, what keeps you from going deeper into God, what keeps you from breakthroughs in your marriage, uh, finances, what's keeping you from your destiny? I want you to, to think about that, and, and, and maybe we'll just uh, we'll take that up and, and uh, just throw it away at the end of the service and, and get rid of it. What is keeping us from fulfilling the destiny? Now, Rick Sutman, he was here, uh, and, and he talked about uh, the, the things of, uh, of God that, that the early church walked in such power and signs and, and, and wondering because they were hearing God and following him. Now, why aren't we doing those things? Plus, Jesus said, what I do, you can do in greater things. What is keeping us from stepping into a, a realm of reality of something that we think that is way out there but is really normal the way we have church and the way we do things really isn't a normal church that we will experience once we get to heaven on the sea of glass. Whoa, with people falling all over the place and, you know, six-winged angels, four-headed creatures. Jesus comes up and shows up in the church on a white horse and fire in his eyes and does just holy, holy. I mean, there is a celebration. Things are just wild. Lightnings and thunderings, you know. I'm not sure they'll have keyboards or guitar. They'll have lightning and thunder. <laughs> and he'll be booming. And he'll be rocking us and shaking us. You know, he'll hit me like a bomb. Rearrange me, change me. You know, and uh, that's really what he, what he wants to do with us. In Ephesians, though we, uh, Ephesians uh, 2.18, for though we both have access by one spirit to the Father, we have access to the Father. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. In other words, when people ask me where I come from, my answer is heaven. And if you can see yourself from that perspective that you were with God, with God before he placed you in a womb, he knew you before he formed you in your mother's womb. If you understand and begin to see that he took Jesus and birthed him forth for a mission impossible, but he heard and walked and listened to the Father, heard his voice, and went and did. And he trained his disciples to do the same thing. And they moved in the miraculous because they were hearing and moving and flowing with the Spirit of the living God. If you see yourself as born in the United States and, and, and your whole purpose is just to have the American dream, get saved and live a live a good life, and then you're, you're fooling yourself because you will enter into battles that you weren't meant to enter into. And you're wondering why you're struggling through life. But if you understand that you are his representative, his son, adopted son and daughter, sent to earth in a garden to dress it and keep it and talk to him every day about the progress that's being made. He might want to have you go down a potato row one day and a carrot row the next. Who knows? But if you're listening to him, whatever you do is going to work out. Are, are we partnering with God in life? Are, are we asking God to partner with us and bless what we're doing? And we become disappointed because it didn't happen the way we thought it would because God it wasn't God's plan for us, but it was a good idea in our own mind. But our ways aren't God's ways, and our thoughts aren't his thoughts. So if we don't hear him, 
we miss out on a whole lot of blessing. The essence of his design for you and me, the essence of it is the being intimate with him, having a relationship with him. Oh, Father, I want them in me, and I want to be in them. The whole essence of a relationship, it is our highest purpose. It, it, more than doing things for, for ourselves or other people or about our ministry or about our job or about our family, if we seek him, all those things begin to fall in line. If we have this relationship with him and hear what he's saying, we would probably would not have to pray about a whole lot of things. They would just happen. They would happen because it was a natural progression of flow to hear what Daddy is saying and just follow his instructions. It makes life a whole a lot simpler. But somehow we have become desensitized to the voice of God and hearing what he has to say. And that we are positioned in this life, we didn't choose, but we are positioned in this life by an unseen hand for yet an unknown purpose. When we're born, we don't know our purpose. We don't even understand that we have a purpose. But then the enemy through the world begins to tell us who we are, our identity, how, how to walk, how to talk, how church should be the right language, being political correct, and we miss out on being kingdom kids, following him, laying down kingdom principles, and taking this land for the Lord Jesus Christ. What are we here on this earth for, and what is holding us back? There is this design of God that he begins to knock on our hearts, and I have an individual invitation that takes us to accept it, to come up and be with him for instructions about ourselves, our life, our families, our communities, our churches, or whatever he has. And if we begin to do that, and we come together, we would see such an explosion of revival across this land that would be unprecedented. We, it, would, it would be so awesome. I cannot do it alone. I need you, and God needs me, and God needs you. I don't know why. He's just chosen to co-labor with me. He has chosen to co-create with me when really I can do nothing. Absolutely nothing. I know nothing. Because I understand that my thinking doesn't even compare with his thinking or my ways don't even compare with his. So if I'm not in tune with the Spirit of God, I miss out on a whole lot of blessings. And I'm going to tell you some of the reasons why and what happens in our progression that the enemy begins to take us out of. If I can keep the seed of that woman from bruising my head by having my God's children not know who they are, but let me define who they are, then they will never, ever bruise my head. Hey, the preparation in Proverbs, the preparation of this heart, seeking after him belongs to me, it says in Proverbs 16. It belongs to me. I choose to get ready. People get ready. Jesus is coming. It's up to me to make a choice that I choose him. And in that preparation of knowing him, the second part of that scripture reads, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. I make the preparation to be with him, to know him. He fills my mouth. He fills my very being with what I'm to say and what I'm to speak and where I'm to go and what I'm to do. You think 
Saturday, I might want to just relax and do, no, I started off with an early men's prayer breakfast. Went into town and lost my phone. Drove all the way uh, down to Morgantown, West Virginia. Spent four hours in teaching and, and preparation and ministering. Left there at four o'clock. Showed up in Bedford, <laughs> between Bedford and Everett, at another meeting that I was supposed to have with two wonderful, awesome guys. Uh, but I got a surprise, and they were invited to go up to the, the lodge and, and do worship. And, and I got to meet a whole lot of people. Got home around 1030. Set up to about 1 o'clock, meditating on what I was to, to bring this morning to you guys. And that's just a typical day. <laughs> but you know what? The deposit, I'm doing what God wants me to do. The deposit in Morgantown was a deposit of you. The deposit, like, they're going to have some wild worship, uh, uh, African worship where I'm going. There's, Afri there's, a, there's a call to the nations uh, about the kingdom of God coming to the nations. And so uh, I, I get the opportunity to, to represent you guys, to represent God, to bring a part of, of our heart, you know, to a part and join in with their heart. Just the, and, and it's the... Uh, it's an awesome time and, and building friendships all over the place. Now, I know that a lot of people's idea that the pastor should stay put, the pastor should be, and the pastor should be here in church, and the pastor should do all the visitations, and the pastor should do everything. But that's really not how it's supposed to be. I'm to equip you and train you, and you're supposed to do it. Hey, don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> our preparation is love. It's how much God loves us and how much we love God, our preparation. God so loved the world that he gave. Ephesians 3.17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you be rooted and grounded, rooted and grounded in love. Verse 19, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. Woo! -hoo! You know, it's just like a, a, a Corvette and a, and a Volkswagen. You can't even compare the two, love and knowledge. I mean, love just goes whoo, right by knowledge. It passes it. It surpasses it. It goes beyond. It covers a multitude. In fact, it covers all sin. It's everything I am and everything he is. God is love. That makes me love. But have I learned to love? Have I learned there to be for his will and not my will? For his purpose and not my purpose? It's passing knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So we got to bypass this. Woo! Get out of the way, brain. I'm passing you. Mm -hmm. Throttle down. Pedal to the metal. Come on. I think I'm supposed to end up in my heart, but really the heart's deceitful and it can deceive me and it's full of all kind of emotions and woo! I mean, sometimes I wear my feelings out on my sleeve. Of course, none of you do. Yeah. But I have to understand that my innermost being, the river of life within me, is flowing. And if I can tap into it to flow out to you, for out of my belly shall flow rivers of living water to reach you and to touch you and to transform you, not that I, but what in me. Silver and gold I don't have, but such as I have. What do I have? Woo! I have the same power that raised Christ from the dead. I have the kingdom of God. I am heaven, so to speak. Well, I heard one guy say in a meeting we were at, he said, I'm heaven. <laughs> hey. In Deuteronomy, talks about 
and God loving us. And it talks about, oh, where am I at here? Deuteronomy 23.8, or 20, yeah, 23.5. Nevertheless, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. Wow. The Lord your God loves you. The Lord your God loves you, cares about you. But this is what gets in our way, our experiences. Our experiences defile us. Our experiences of maybe being in that womb and hearing the, the parents, oh, yeah, you know, you need to get an abortion. You need to get this. I don't want that child. I don't want this. I don't want that. I mean, your experiences out, out of the womb, what happens along the way? You hear about a God and you, and you say, yeah, I want that God. I mean, I, I'm reading about him. Signs, wonders, miracles, going to take care of me. I have a covenant. I'm covered with the blood. And then all of a sudden something happens. Lord, I don't want my mom to die. I'm interceding. I'm believing. I'm, I'm, I'm standing on your word. I'm confessing your, your word. You're my healer. You're my deliverer. You're heard. We're in agreement. The church is in agreement. I got 100,000 churches all over the United the world believing that my mom is going to rise up and not die. She dies. What happens to me? What happens? Oh, my finances. I cannot believe it. God, I believe in you. You said, I, if I loved you, you said in Proverbs, if I love you, you would bring wealth to me. And you would see that my bank account, that I would be lacking nothing. If I'm complete in you, I'm lacking nothing, God. But my bank account is reading zero, zero. Oh, wait a minute, minus, minus, minus. Oh. What's going on, God? I'm struggling. I'm reading your promises. I'm having people agree with me. I'm standing on your word. Hey. All of a sudden, inside us, whether we admit it or whether we don't, we feel God left us down. And when we try to believe for something else, that doubt. See, the problem is not that, that we don't love God. We know ourselves and we know we're in love with God. I love you, God. The problem is we're not sure that he loves us to that degree. Though it's crazy thinking. We go by our experiences, not by... His voice, not by the Spirit. We, we, we go by what's happening to us in life. Why did you hook me up with this man or this woman? Or, or why is my child not normal like the rest of the kids? Or why, God, was I even allowed to have a baby? How come I'm believing for life and I'm, I'm, I'm not getting... What I, 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 I want. And so we're locked in this grid of experiences of reality versus what really is available to us and that can happen. Because we begin to have a picture of how life is. And because we have a picture of how life is, we put with that rules and regulations and when those people violate those rules and regulations then it gives us the right to be offended and because we're offended we withhold our love from them we back up from them because they may not have fit our picture that they they messed up so i'm not going to fellowship with them i don't care what you say god i'm not going to visit i'm not going to call them 
I've, I've been to their house the last hundred times, and they've never been to my house once. I've called them the last 50 times, but they never call me. I'm offended, so I'm withholding my love from them. We place value on people, and the value that we place on people determines how we treat them. My God values everybody the same. He loves everybody the same. His love never fails. He is always with me. He never leaves me nor forsakes me. He loves me when I'm messing out. He said, Bill, you're no longer a sinner. You're a saint who occasionally sins. That puts freedom in, in me, the knowing if I do mess up, he's not mad or he's not angry with me. Wow. I think that I read that somewhere in Ephesians. What's keeping me from the promises of God is me, myself. As a man thinks, so is he. What keeps me from God is my experiences in life where I feel that God has left me down. So when I begin to believe for more, I'm really down deep inside have plan B in case God doesn't come through for me. Of course, none of you guys do that, just me. What happens after that? I have it down here. This, this is a cute little saying. I like it. Do not let the circumstances in life dictate your stance in life. Do not let your circumstances in life dictate your stance in life. So from God letting you down through an experience comes number two, no real expectations of God's real involvement in my life. No real expectation that God's going to be with me on this project or this project or this project. See, the problem of it is it still is like our thinking's wrong. It's not like God... Uh, I feel like I want to do this, so I'm praying and believing that you're going to bless me. I'm praying that you believe this business deal is going to work out for me. I, I believe that this is the person uh, that you want me to marry, but it's not working out. And then all of a sudden, you know, the revelation and the understanding is, God, what do you want me to do today? Who do you want me to partner with? What business deal do you want me to get in? Let me come alongside you, God, hear what you have to say. Instead of me asking you to come alongside me. When things begin to happen, my expectation level begins to rise and my faith begins to arise, even though it doesn't because I have all the faith I ever want to need. If I have the faith of the grain of a mustard seed, I got all that I need. It's not about faith, it's about authority and understanding that. We won't go there today. That's a whole nother message. Number three, our attitudes begins to change. And we begin to think, that's life. That's just how it is. I need to accept it. That's just life. I look around and all my friends are going through the same thing. Everybody's getting sick at the same time. Everybody's worried about their job at the same time. Uh, not everybody. But you know what I'm, I mean. Our attitudes begin to change because inside, God left me down. Number four. We love God and We're really not sure he loves us, so what happens is we get captured in doing things for God to earn his love. We unknowingly lose the sensitivity of hearing his voice when we get involved in doing things for God 
so that maybe he would love me so that when I'm believing for something that it would come to tuition. But the revelation is I don't have to do nothing. I, I don't have to be pastor. I just have to be a son. I don't have to be a school teacher. I just have to be a son. I don't have to work at JLG. I just have to be a son. I don't have to be a dentist or a lawyer or truck driver or stay-at-home mom or anything. I just have to be a son or a daughter. I'm called to be filled with love and give love away, and that's it. I am not called to be the Holy Spirit. I'm not tr called to try to figure everything out. I'm called to hear him and have a relationship with him. I'm called to be like him and won't be satisfied until I turn into his likeness. If you can't see it, you're, you remain restrained in your ability to bring it to pass. If we no longer hear him, not seeing your ability in God to change the atmosphere, to, to change your region, But seeing how it is, that does bring that offense when it doesn't happen. How do I know? I, I was involved in a church one time. The church fell apart. It went from like 200, 250 people down to 15 people. Offense came. I got offended. I left church. I didn't go to church. I didn't want anything to do with it. I didn't attend church for four years. Then one day I heard my daughter say, to my wife, he said, how come dad doesn't go to church anymore? All right, Lord, I'll go for her sake, not mine. I don't want to go, but I'll, I'll go just to take her. And I, so I started going to church just because I, I wanted to have my children. I was trying to reason it out and think it out in my own self. What was the best thing to do? I didn't, I didn't care anymore. I didn't want nothing to do with church. I don't want anything to do with organized church. I hate it. I hate religion. I've never, ever been in a church, really, actually, that I felt loved or wanted or needed. It was a conditional love. If you stay here, if you do these things, if you be nice, if you don't get too, too out there, if you don't dance, if you don't raise your hands, we will love you. <laughs> I don't want to go there anymore. But you get my drift. We let these offenses keep us. Kept me out of church for four years. And somebody in Gettysburg said, will you come and teach in my Bible school? Ah, don't want to do that. God says, I want you to do that. I don't want to do that. I want you to do it. I don't want to do it. <laughs> okay. So I went there, and I, I, you know, I found, found myself in a class of people that knew more than I did, you know. So it got me digging in the Word. It got me, and that was God's plan. Dig, I get back in the Word, seeking Him, hearing Him, wanting Him. And slowly, doors began to open up, and I began to be asked to speak at different places. And, and even that's how I met Scott, you know. God says, uh, another guy asked me to come to Huntington to teach in a and a Bible school there, and I said, no, I don't want to do that. And God says, go for one time. And that one time, I met Scott and, and uh, began to meet uh, some wonderful people from Satella through, through that relationship. See, God has a plan. And, and the same thing, when he says, Bill, I want you to start a church. I said, no, too many churches already. Why? Because of the offense, because of my attitude, what I thought of church. And yuck. Too many churches already, God. Transform one of them. You don't need another one. <laughs> really? It was, I had, what down here, attitude. <laughs> That's life. <laughs> and so finally, his persistence was, I'll do it if you tell my wife. Of course, she didn't know anything that was going on. About two weeks later, she came to me and she says, I think we're supposed to start a church. 
I said, all right. So here we are. You know, I'm somewhere where I really didn't want to be. I'm in a good company. Jesus found himself in a place that he didn't want to be either. In fact, he even asked the Father, is there any other way to take this cup from me? <laughs> and he says, Jesus understood this. It wasn't about what he wanted, but what the Father wanted. It's not about what I want or what you want. It's about what your Heavenly Father, the very one who created you, what, what does he want from you? What kind of relationship does he want from you? What kind of things does he want from you? These things begin to happen because we, we have left our first love. And we have left it so slowly that we didn't even know. It all started with a thing where God really must not love me. He left me down. He didn't come through for me. And I said, and this is how, like, when God speaks to me, I usually say, God, give me scripture to back that up. <laughs> and uh, he gave me Proverbs 13, 12. So, let's turn to Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when desires come, it is a tree of life. Yeah, I looked at that, and I just felt like uh, to go to the Message Bible. I have like 20 different Bibles at home, different ones, and, and I just felt I was to get the Message Bible. And uh, the Message Bible says it this way. Unrelenting disappointment leaves you heart sick. Unrelenting disappointment leaves you heart sick. But a sudden break can turn your life around. The sudden break that turns our life around is our, our trip on the road to Damascus when our eyes are opened up to the truth and we begin to think a different way. When we hear a revelation, an understanding, when God breaks in on us in such a way that we begin to see it his way and not our way. When we think we're doing good, we find out that we're doing evil and we repent of it and go the other way. Saul became Paul and began to do and lay his life down for what the Father wanted him to do. And all the disciples, once they had that encounter, began to do the same thing. If we do not have an encounter with God, we will remain and we will end up in heaven, but we will not fulfill the destiny and dreams God's called us to. Do not let offenses keep you from your destiny. Do not allow that to take place. The battle, God is saying, I believe in you. If he didn't believe in you, he would have made you robots. If he didn't believe in you, he wouldn't give you a free will to choose. He had confidence in you that you would make the right decision. God is saying, I believe in you. I heard that loud and clear. The Lord said, I believe in you. Wow, God believes in me. God, I know me. I don't know if I would believe in me. But you believe in me. There is no victory without a battle. The problem is we choose the wrong battle. To be an overcomer, you must first overcome something. To have authority over it. But we choose to fight the wrong battle and we fight other people's battle or we fight in an arena that we're not qualified or what God wants us. He has a battle for us to fight. And we won't know it until we know him.
What is man in Job chapter 7? What is man that you should exalt him? Wow. That you should set your heart on him. God wants to exalt you. He has his heart set on you. He adores you. He loves you. He wants to bring you into the fullness. He's saying this morning, I am not your disappointment. I am your goodness. And I believe in you. What is man that you should visit him every morning? Of course, we don't like the next part, and test him every moment. That testing, that Joseph in the pit, prophet in training, that put away in jail, secluded for a time, a process that he was taking him through to bring him, to bring his people out. When I go through battles, my first question is always this anymore. What are you trying to teach me? What is it that I don't get, God? He never answered me, has never answered me why. Never has he ever answered, why is this happening? Why did this person die? Why did I lose my job? Why? He's never answered that. But he's always answered, I'm trying to show you this. I'm trying to teach you this. I'm trying to bring you into the fullness of what I have for you. Wow. God is a good God. Isaiah 6, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up here. Where are we at here? Time, we're doing good. Isaiah 61, verse 3. To console those who mourn in Zion, to give beauty for ashes. Wow. The oil of joy for mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they all may be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord. That he may be glorified. You are the planning of the Lord. You didn't choose where you would be born or what you would look like or what giftings and talent you have. He planted you where he wanted you because he had a miraculous, marvelous plan for your life. You carry a profound, awesome call in your life, completely beyond your natural ability to accomplish That's why it's mission impossible, but with him it becomes possible. The battle that we were born for, the victory that's already ours, I am the planning of the Lord. He brings me the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness to, to get off of me and to flee. My ashes, he's changed into beauty because he likes me, he loves me, and he wants some more of me. My mind has been twisted. My mind has been deceived. My heart has been deceived at times. But my spirit knows that God is good all the time. My spirit knows that God never leaves me or forsakes me. My spirit knows so when I connect with it, I begin to see life in a whole different way. It hurts me to this day to think about Robin. Because I loved him. I miss him. But God needed him more than we did, kind of like Enoch. Enoch was and was no more. He's running, and my celebration with Robin is he's running and leaping and praising God.
I know the thoughts I have toward you, Jeremiah 29, 11, says the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. It's time to give Jesus Christ the rewards of his suffering. It's time for us to realign ourselves with the Spirit of God and seek him in a such a way that we begin to hear his voice, in such a way that we come into fellowship with him, that we see everything that he has for us. And people see what we have and what we carry and want what we have the Lord Jesus Christ, because they see his goodness in us, his mercy in us, his love in us, his not judging in us. He begins to see it all. I'm going to read one more scripture. I have a couple more, but one more I want to read. I want to read uh, uh, Ephesians 2, 18, 19, and 22. For through him we both have access by one spirit to Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundations and of, of the apostles and prophets. We've done away with apostles and prophets, haven't we? But my Bible says they're built upon seeing, understanding what's going on in heaven. Uh, my Bible says we're to pray for, for the things in heaven to be on earth. We are a, a people that needs to begin to think in a little different way. We are a people that are sent here as aliens and strangers in a foreign land to make a difference where we are planted. I repent a lot. I'm going to read one more scripture. Psalms 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who, God forgives all your iniquities. God who heals all your diseases, the God who redeems your life from destruction, the God who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, the God who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your, your youth is renewed like the eagles. Wow. See, it's all in God. If we seek him, we have it all. If we know him, we have it all. And we will come in to our fullness that he created us for. Amen? Amen. Stand with me. Thank you, Lord. Hey. I bind and I loosen all the relentless disappointments in our lives, Lord Father God. That struggle that has impacted us in a negative way, Lord, I release that from your people in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I speak and fill up that empty spaces with your love and your presence and of your glory. I ask for an encounter along the way this week. I ask, Lord, Father God, that their bodies become strengthened and whole in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I ask you, Lord, to bring them revelation and understanding of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, Father God, that they hear, that they have ears to hear and eyes to see what you're doing on this earth, Lord, Father God. That we walk in that fullness that you've called us to. That we hook arms up, Lord, Father God. That we might be a people like you, you said, Lord, to the Tower of Babel, you said they're all one accord, they're all speaking the same thing. Now there's nothing, nothing, nothing 
that they've imagined to do that they can't do. I got to come down so they can't accomplish that because they're all in one accord. But I'm believing for the day when the Lord Jesus Christ begins to say, look, Dad, they're all speaking the same thing. They're all one accord. Hey, they're all asking for the kingdom to come. They're all asking for the glory of God. They're all moving in the spirit, Lord. There is nothing. Lord, heaven is coming to earth. Daddy, look. Jesus, when he comes back, he's coming back for a, a church that's moving in those things. It's not a building. It's us. It's the people. We ought to be able to hook up with every believer, no matter what the sign on the doorpost. And march in unity and one accord to give Jesus the rewards of his suffering. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's... Let's do it. So did my question at the beginning was what? What's holding you back? What's keeping you from it? You answer that yourself. You ask God to give you the answer for that. You write it down on a piece of paper and then lay a match to it and burn it up. Because I see greatness in you. I see the glory of God on you. I see that nothing is impossible with you and with the Lord Jesus Christ. So be blessed! <laughs> That's the most awesomest prayer that you can pray on anybody. Two words. Be blessed. If they're blessed, they're not sick, they're not having financial problems, they're not struggling. If they're blessed, and all their needs are being met. So I say to you, be blessed. And amen. God bless you. Have an awesome week.